Hello everyone, my name is Brendan Snyder. Thank you so much for joining me and welcome to another question and answer session number seven. A lot of S's in there for this particular one. Uh, so having just hit 8,000 subscribers, and again, I wanna say thank you so much to everyone who's being a part of this channel, the community that we are creating here. I'm doing this question and answer session as a thank you to you for that. You can get to know a little bit more about me and ask all the questions you've ever wanted to know uh, that haven't already been answered, uh, potentially at least through the videos that I'm making here. What this boils down to is we've got 45 questions to cover coming from 30 different people. A lot of people had multiple questions or kind of part ones and part twos of questions. So that's why there's a few more questions than people that requested it. Uh, some people asked uh, same questions. So those get grouped together and stuff of that nature. But it breaks down into 32 music questions five related to the channel itself, and eight of them that I would classify as personal questions, of which I'm willing to answer anything here. So just to catch uh, some people up here who might not uh, know and or are new to the channel, I am a licensed registered architect in the state of New York, so that is my day job, but of course, music being my passion is what I love. And I did start collecting music 33 years ago in 1989, or at least got serious about it at that time I have well over 11,000 CDs and more than 200 box sets. So just sort of set the mood here as to uh, my content and everything. And uh, as always, I'm gonna do my best to uh, try to pronounce everyone's name correctly, but I'm not the best at uh, name pronunciation, so if I get it wrong, I apologize up front. All right, we're gonna kick off with music-related questions, of which there's 32 to go through. First one comes from Demetrius Metalus, and he asks, um, how did you build your music collection over the years? He's actually got three questions here. We're gonna start with this one. So uh, simple in the fact that I just really bought one piece at a time. Uh, one of the, the next question in here is, have you always bought as much music as you do now? And the question, or to, to you know, elaborate on that, the answer is no. So it's sort of tying into that first one. Um, buying one piece at a time, you know, growing up as a, a young kid, teenager, whatever, you know, having an allowance and then getting a new job, you know, didn't have nearly as much money as I have today. So a lot of times I had to really debate and decide which album I was buying, you know, that week or every other week or whatever. I didn't go out and buy nearly as much as I have today. Of course, I very quickly learned about used CDs and that I could get more if I bought used as opposed to brand new. So I would do that oftentimes to sort of stretch the money. Um, but uh, you want to know, what did I do before the internet? And um, at the time, really the reality is there was a lot more music stores. And so I could hit tons and tons of music stores. And there were music programs like Headbangers Ball on MTV and stuff like that. There was also news publications, a magazine called Ice, that had all of the release dates and everything for every month, and that magazine came out announcing things. So I really relied on stuff like that. There were also books that uh, had information on albums that you could go through. I still have those today, but with the internet, we don't need it. So we just did it in a different way, but it's basically all the same information that's out on the internet today used to be available in physical print or in some format of that nature. All right, uh, Landon Prott, uh, what was your very first CD you ever owned? Motley Crue, Dr. Feelgood from 1989. That's why I say that was when I uh, sort of officially began collecting. I actually got it for Christmas that year. I had bought it on cassette myself uh, several months earlier when it first came out. But as I switched over into CD, that was the first one I requested to get. Got it for, for Christmas and uh, you know never looked back ever since. William Rogers wants to know, what was the first album that I bought? And so the first one that I actually bought with my own money was Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction, of which I bought on cassette, probably 1988, uh, late 87 or early 88. I uh, don't remember the exact year on it, but it was after a number of the big hits from the album had already been out. At that time, being a young kid, I didn't go out and buy something before I knew what it was or with only one song. I sort of bought things based on, well, this album has three songs I know versus this one that only has one song I know. I'm a little different today in it, but that's kind of how I made decisions back then. And he wants to know what the first concert was that I saw. ACDC with King's X opening. And uh, that'll play in a little bit later to another question that another subscriber has asked. John Zook asks, 
When you were younger, what made you take note of music and what set off this sort of lifelong path that you're on? And um, I really had to kind of think about this one. This was a good question here. But I think uh, because I've always been more of an introvert than an extrovert, uh, listening to music is something that you can do as a solitary thing. But on the flip side of that, it's also a great icebreaker. It's a good thing. I remember being young where you could go up and ask somebody who is your favorite band and it kind of broke the ice and so forth. So music was something that I found that I could do on my own, but I could also use as that connecting tool with other people. And so I think that's one of the things that really drew me into music. Uh, also just in that it is you know great sound and hearing bands that you like and so forth. But beyond just that, finding something that you like like. Um, I think there were some other cool underlying things. All right, Morletti Guitar asks, what music book have you recently been reading? And um, I got this one for Christmas. Actually, my mom got it for me. So thanks, mom. Paul McCartney, The Lyrics. It's actually uh, two volumes in here. And it goes through all of the songs that he's ever written in the lyrics and tells little stories behind them and so forth. It's got a lot of cool photos. So I haven't read anything recently, like a biography or something of that nature. There have been a few that have come out, but I haven't really been interested in the full life stories of those particular artists. I'm kind of waiting for the next one to drop where I want to read and devour the whole thing before I buy one of those. Another question from Morletti is, um, are there any bands that you listened to when you were younger but can't now? And I would say this is not so much that I can't listen to it, but just not really my cup of tea anymore. I was a big fan of DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince when I was growing up, had a cassette. Uh, parents just don't understand with that song on it. I think a lot of uh, young kids of my age had that at the time. It was a big hit. Um, but it's just not something I ever would listen to anymore. So I don't actually even own that one anymore. All right, uh, Willie Trotter asks, uh, do you buy concert DVDs and Blu-rays? Yes, I do. And I've even done a few reviews on some of them in particular. I've done a comparison on um, a Deep Purple one with David Coverdale and Tommy Bolin. Um, there's a great um, uh, live, well, it's a documentary, but it's also got live content on there from that era. And then I've also done a comparative of two Rush uh, DVDs that I've had. And so uh, certainly if newer ones come out, I would do that, but it's getting interesting. It seems to be less and less bands releasing them, I think because so much of that stuff is out streaming now. And a lot of these bands are simply just uploading this stuff to their uh, YouTube pages. And even like Alice Cooper, who released a live album a few years back in Evening with Alice Cooper, did not release the DVD or Blu-ray of that at the time. He later put it out as part of Detroit Stories as a bonus disc with that. So I just think that uh, concert DVDs and Blu-rays are not selling like they used to. And that's why we're actually not seeing a lot of that happen. So I do have a huge collection, several hundred if not more, of Blu-rays, DVDs, and things of that nature. All right, Ellis Martin asks, did you like the show MTV Headbangers Ball? Absolutely. It was one of my absolute favorite things. And if I couldn't be home to watch it, I always made sure my mom could record it for me and then I could watch it after that. Those three hours every week, that was the show I looked forward to more than anything. Most recently, I've actually tried to create my own version of it called Metal After Midnight, in which I do the same thing, introduction of music videos, music news, uh, album release schedules, things of that nature all worked into a half hour program. And I've made two episodes uploaded and they've been blocked both times by YouTube due to copyright issues. So unfortunately, I don't think I'll be trying it again, but if I can ever figure out exactly how to get around the copyright issues of these things, um, I may do that because I just absolutely loved that program. But I will say this, I did create a playlist of 25 music videos, classic music videos from back in the day, calling it Metal After Midnight so you can, from this channel, find the playlist section and scroll through it till you see Metal After Midnight, click play all, and at least feel like you're watching Headbangers Ball. All right, and uh, did the show itself introduce you to any new bands? And absolutely every week, all the time, too many to even count, it was my main go-to place to find new bands. Next up, Kevin J asks, um, are there my CD boxes, and I will turn this a little bit to show you guys, so those out there, are those CD boxes alphabetized? And yes, they are. And so I recently had filmed a video on here uh, called something like, um, 
you know, how to sort through 9,270 uh, CDs in 103 boxes. And I was just basically showing how I get through those. And I've neglected to answer and or say that one, each stack, so if we look at these out here, those are 12 high, and each stack in there is a particular genre. The one that's closest to us here is actually alternative rock. The next one you see over there is actually heavy metal. Next to that, which is the one that was in the video that I was presenting, was all glam rock, and the one to the other side of that is all regular, what I would call straight ahead rock, classic rock, that sort of stuff. And so they're each different genres, and then within that, each of those boxes are alphabetized. So I do know roughly where to go, how many boxes down within the stack to go to get to it. So when I pulled out the, the Def Leppard under the Ds, I actually knew where I was going to pull that out. I had pre-planned to pull out a Def Leppard um, CD when I got to that point kind of a thing. So uh, yes, they are alphabetized. All right, David J. Meister asks, do you buy used CDs? Yes, absolutely. So, David, maybe you haven't uh, watched some of my New Music Finds videos and or paid very close attention in the uh, records, you know, let's go to the record store videos, but lots of those are used CDs. So I don't buy only new things. I don't have any problems buying new things. So, um, you know, he also asks, you know, do I visit flea markets, garage sales, thrift stores? Well, New York City doesn't really have those things. There are some flea markets in and around the city, although I don't know if there's any going on right now due to COVID, but I have seen some in the past. Definitely no garage sales. Um, we don't have garages, not really, at least here in New York City. And there are thrift stores, but I find very few and far between that carry CDs. And then if they are carrying CDs, a lot of times it's just the big main stuff, Led Zeppelin, Aerosmith, whatever. With over 11,000 CDs, I have most of what these types of stores carry. So um, a lot of what is left is stuff that I don't already own or what I do already own. And so it is sort of lends itself to uh, me having to, you know, pick and choose at that point. But yes, I do buy used uh, stuff. I have no problem with it. All right, Mark Durain asks, um, since you visit record stores often, do you know the people that work there? And a follow-up question, are you friends? And so, yes, a couple of the music stores I go to, I am friends with people that are there, I know them quite well. We text back and forth and keep in touch, go to lunch, stuff like that. So yeah, I do know these people. And other ones, uh, we simply just know who each other are, meaning that I come in all the time kind of stuff. Some of them, I don't even know their name, but I've been seeing them for years and years and years on end, and we just know each other from appearance. But um, yeah, how can you not when you go into these stores so often and you get into conversations about music, uh, about uh, bands that you both love, how can you not be friends? Karen Trope asks, uh, do the music stores you visit often allow ordering online? And lots of those do. I would say basically any of the videos that you've seen me put up that are the, um, let's go to the record store or record store experience, most of those have an online website. Some of them only have Facebook pages, but in most cases, if you see something in the video that you like that I've posted and you reach out to them and it's still available, they will package it up and send it to you. Other ones have different content available online from what is in the store. So it's not always a one-to-one -one ratio, but I have asked them and they do allow ordering online. Captain Beyond asked me to name my five or my top five favorite guitar players. And so starting at number five, Neil Sean of Journey, Steve Morse from the Dixie Dregs, but also Deep Purple. And I was more a fan of his as a solo artist than either of those two bands. Uh, Steve Vai coming in at number three, Eddie Van Halen at number two, and for the number one top spot, David Gilmore, Pink Floyd being my top favorite band, have to go with David Gilmore. Absolutely love uh, his guitar playing. I find it so unique. Tony Fisher asks, can you suggest a few newer bands with a clean hard rock sound, uh, similar to Rival Sons and Greta Van Fleet? So yeah, I've got three of them here. Dirty Honey is uh, one of the newest ones out that I would highly, highly recommend. I like them a lot. One that's been out a little bit longer that uh, I enjoy is Tyler Bryant and The Shakedown. And then one of these that I've seen in concert that kind of blew me away, but I actually don't own anything yet from Joyous Wolf. Really, really great live performers. 
All right, here's a uh, username that's uh, quite interesting. I like pizza on my motor oil blues. Ask the question, why do you think Bon Jovi gets so little respect? This person obviously being a big Bon Jovi fan and so am I, which I think is why they've asked this question, knowing that I like Bon Jovi. Um, I think it really just goes back to uh, Bon Jovi, even though they started early in the 80s, really were seen as a glam metal band coming up in uh, you know 86 to 88 and so forth with Slippery When Wet in New Jersey and kind of being right at the forefront of all that even though Bon Jovi like Guns N' Roses like Def Leppard have really um, excelled beyond and grown out of that title as a hair band glam metal band um, they are still seen that way and so a lot of people don't give them the respect they should in reality Bon Jovi, in my opinion, is every bit as good as Springsteen, uh, Dylan, maybe some of you guys will laugh at that, but the storytelling aspect that John Bon Jovi can do within his songs and um, the creativeness and the telling of that and the musical relation in his music to bring those moods and things across, I think is just as good for his genre as it is for the genres from Springsteen, Dylan, and so forth, Tom Petty. You know, he's just a great artist in that, that regard. But I think, unfortunately, it's overshadowed by the fact that they are a band from the 80s. And the same can be said for Def Leppard, who really deserves a lot more attention than they get at this point. Um, but again, I think it's just overshadowed from the era that they came from. All right, William uh, Tyndale asks, are you a fan of King's X? I mentioned early on that uh, the first concert I went to had King's X opening for uh, ACDC. And so, yes, obviously I am. Also wants to know if I collect all these solo and side projects. So I thought I'd show you this box of uh, 30 um, CDs here, which has uh, the King's X stuff up front, but a lot of solo stuff there at the end, side projects and so forth. And this isn't even the full box. I have since pulled a bunch of stuff from uh, Doug Pinnock out of here uh, to keep readily available, a good stack of stuff because it doesn't fit in the box either. Those guys have so many different side projects and solo things. So tons and tons of stuff like the Jelly Jam and I've got solo Jerry Gaskill in here and Doug Pinnock and Ty Tabor and stuff of that nature, but uh, Super Shine and just lots of great stuff. I do really like King Sex. Super excited for the brand new album that is complete, although we don't have a release date for it yet. And there is a brand new Ty Tabor album that is coming out in the, either the next few weeks or next month or so. All right, next up, James Levin asks the question if I am a fan of Accept. Yes, I am, and wants to know my favorite album, which is not the one you might expect. This one is Metal Heart. I just really love that album. I think it is a step up from the previous album, uh, you know, which has the, the big hit balls to the walls and stuff of that nature and everything on it. A lot of people would gravitate towards that album for me alone. It is Metal Heart. Next question is from Rick and Lynette Rivera, who asks, uh, what band did you love as a kid and no longer do? And then follow-up question to that is, what band did you dislike at the time but uh, now love? And so first off, I would say, not necessarily that I don't dislike this band or anything. My interest has just waned quite a bit since they came out. White Zombie and more so Rob Zombie. I think if White Zombie were still around, I'd be much more into them. But Rob Zombie, as a solo artist, I enjoyed his first couple solo releases. And now it's just, I enjoy it, I get it, but I almost never go back and listen to those albums. So I really kind of feel myself pulling away from that sort of industrial metal style that he does. And then a band that I never could get into as a kid and even up to a few years ago was Gentle Giant. But again, if you've watched some of my new music finds, going to the record store videos, things of that nature, recently I've been buying a lot of Gentle Giant. So my interests have changed in that regard. They're always changing and growing. And bands that I wasn't into originally, I now find myself um, enjoying a lot of. All right, Andreas from Greece asks, um, are there any bands that you like from the 70s, but not their work from the later 80s and 90s? And I would say, no, typically it actually goes the other way around. I grew up in the 80s and the 90s. So for me, generally, I enjoy the 80s and 90s most. And it might be the other way around that I like less of the 70s or later periods than I do of the 80s. And that would be typical to like ZZ Top, Aerosmith, and Journey. Now, don't get me wrong, I like all of the periods of those bands, but if I had to pick albums that are my favorites, it's always gonna fall from the 80s within those three bands, as opposed to albums out of the 70s, 90s, or later. 
Jose Vincent Lazo asks, what is your favorite musical decade? Tying into that last question, the 80s, whether it be the new wave, new wave of British heavy metal, glam metal, and or just the continuation of a lot of 70s great rock bands coming in to the 80s and making great albums like Aerosmith and Alice Cooper and stuff of that nature. Some of my favorite albums by those artists, Aerosmith's Pump, Alice Cooper's Trash, those are right there smack dab in the middle of the late 80s. So um, again, 80s uh, being my period. But that's also the era I grew up in. I was born in 1976. So I was, uh, you know, 10, 11, 12 in the late 80s there. And that's really what I grew into. Keith Morris asks if I'm into jazz fusion. Not specifically, but I do like some of the bands that branch into it. Dixie Dregs, Steely Dan, Bella Fleck artists like that i do enjoy those artists i've even gone and seen uh, steely dan a number of times so a um, little bit on that sort of stuff but the real straight up jazz fusion not so much renee berkey asks uh, are there any albums that i bought that were simply just flops for me ones that i didn't like and the only one that i bought that i put on and i just absolutely couldn't believe how bad it is and i will actually say that and i don't usually say that about so many albums was danzig album called danzig sings elvis and an album that i expected to have a danzig sound performing cover versions of elvis songs turned out to actually be glenn danzig crooning and singing in an easy listening style of uh elvis and it's just not even something that has any rock amount to it and or sound like a Danzig album. So shocking, just nothing that I would have been interested in. So I have kept it. I did not get rid of it. It is something still in the collection, but um, just nothing that I'm probably gonna go back to. All right, moving into channel related questions. We have five of them here. First up, Stacy Simmer asks, have you gotten the attention of record labels yet sending you promos for reviews and things of that nature? And a little bit. Um, management for Skid Row, I asked if I would be happy enough to review this box set, The Atlantic Years, a uh, five disc box set spanning their Atlantic Years. And yes, absolutely I was. And I did do a review of that and that was really great. And uh, any other record labels or management companies that might happen to be seeing this, I would be interested so uh, certainly reach out and contact me but I've also done some other collaborative things I've worked with societies and um, did promotions on their shirts and things of that nature they're a really great t-shirt company and then another company called Q78 that has um, LP holders and things of that nature so I have done some of that and I often get a lot of requests by brand new bands that are just coming out just starting but as I'm trying to grow my channel here I'm really sticking to more established bands to help grow my channel as well as to have a foothold of things that you guys uh, know and are interested in once I get bigger I do plan to branch out into some unknown groups and things and try to help promote them okay sir Norman asks are you going to resume the best album by year series and actually interestingly I got two people asking that question this go around and I would like to restart it up it was a series that I really enjoyed but it didn't do very well. It was one of my lower um, viewed videos. So I kind of let it go by the wayside. I think I stopped at the year 78, although I had planned on going all the way through to 2021 from 71 to 2021 and doing 50 years. So I'll put the question out to you guys. If this is a series that you enjoyed and you miss, let me know. If I get enough interest in it, I'll certainly bring it back. If nothing else, I will do a new video for 1979 and 1980, and we'll just see what it does. But um, honestly, only going to stick with things that uh, are successful on here. So that is why that one, at least at the point, has fallen by the wayside. Okay, and Fez Monkey wants to know, uh, how do you come up with new video ideas? And so I would say the biggest thing is it's just whatever it is that I am interested in at the moment, meaning whatever it is that I'm listening to. So I get a lot of requests, especially from Fez Monkey, always asking me to do album rankings. If I'm not into the current band at the time, it's very hard for me to get in the mindset to do rankings. So I really listen and devour those albums to put together proper rankings for you guys. So I can't just do these things off the top of my head. So if I'm into a certain artist, I'm listening to things, or I'm into a certain style or genre of music, that'll often dictate 
what it is that, that videos are gonna be made. I also listen to subscriber feedback. So what it is that you guys are asking. In this particular case, I just mentioned the best albums by years. I normally probably wouldn't have even responded to this question, but I got two of you guys asking. So I thought I'd open it up put it out there to you guys. I do pay attention to all of the album rankings that Fez Monkey asks, and they are being sort of kept in the back of my mind. And if I get into those um, artists or genres at a particular point really deep, I will consider doing them. But also I just try to keep things really interesting. So I don't like to repeat uh, videos. I don't wanna make the same thing over and over just in different ways. So for instance, the, um, going to record stores, right? So I had started an original series called, um, I would name the record store and then call it an old school record store experience. And I made you know five or six of those. Then I tried something a little different that was called let's go to the record store, but I wanted to fill it with enough different things and present it to you in a different way that made it worthwhile as a completely different style of video. So I also don't really plan to go back to the same music stores and film the exact same thing. So until I find new record stores, I won't necessarily um, be going back and repeating those things. And right now with only having four or five to go to, that's why those series usually stop where they do, because I am trying to keep these videos that I make each unique and each interesting but it just has to do with basically content that i don't see out there on youtube and in the internet you know uh, world and that sort of stuff and things that i i hopefully think you will be interested in seeing okay jared l asked when you when will you create a logo for your channel so not necessarily a logo for the channel but i did create this one from music news roundup so if you get the headphones from music the word news and the up arrow i was trying to come up with a cool logo and i painted that myself or drew that myself uh, for it um, at the time when i put that out there a lot of people didn't really think it was worth anything and I, not that i got negative uh, criticism on it but just people were just like eh so i never went with it but um yeah i would like a logo instead of just using my face as a picture and uh, martin murray is someone who is a former graphic designer that i did reach out to at one point and he's been nice enough to help me with some different uh things and so forth but uh, i have to say i'm not really sure what i'm looking for i am thinking maybe something with my initials b and s something that gives it the the sort of rock or metal feel to it but um yeah i'm not exactly sure what could be a logo since my name is the channel it's not something that if the name of the show was um you know uh metal mania or whatever you know you could easily make something logoed related that was a picture of that having it be my name makes it a little more difficult and i just haven't really come up with what it is but i am thinking about it and at some point perhaps i will do one I will say this, I will open it up. If there's anybody out there that has ideas, that wants to sketch something, find me on Facebook, send me a sketch of your image. I would be more than happy to look at it and consider it um, and give you even give you some feedback on it. Okay, uh, follow up question from Jared L is, are there any plans to make more of the CD and Vinyl Guy episodes to make it more of a regular series? And most of this is just related to my co-host in that Chris Profi, who recently started uh, performing live. He is a uh, guitar player and a music teacher who sings. And so he started, put together a band and started performing live. So that's actually taken up a lot more of his time. We had discussed it. We were trying to get on a weekly uh, series and for a short time we did. And then unfortunately, uh, he just got busy with things. He's also um, has children. So he has responsibilities and things more so than I do. But I'm gonna reach out to him and see if we can reactivate and do some more things because I know you guys enjoy it. I love working with him. He's a great uh, sort of foil person to bounce things off of. We see a lot of things eye to eye. And uh, since he gives a uh, different uh, insight into things than I have, I know that it's always uh, fun for you guys. So I will definitely make more of an effort to do that. All right, and then uh, wrapping things up here with personal questions, we have eight of these. William Rogers asks, why did you move to Florida from, or why did you move from Florida 
to New York City. And so, yes, I grew up in Florida my whole life there. And then I moved to New York City for college, for grad school. So I'd actually done my undergraduate at the University of Florida. And then I came to New York for graduate school at the University of Columbia to get my master's in architecture. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I am an architect, which is also why I always wear the architect shirt in these channel update and question and answer video, as opposed to wearing music concert related shirts and things of that nature. Just something a little different because these are personal things as opposed to specifically music about another band or whatever. Buffalo Mike asks, uh, is it as expensive to live in New York City as they say it is? Yes, very true, but you also make a lot more money in New York City, so in a way it sort of balances itself out. Um, there's a lot more in taxes as well, unfortunately, because it is so much more expensive to run a city like New York. So a lot of people who live in New Jersey or the surrounding uh, states and then come in because the taxes in those states are less and they can make the money of New York City and it goes further where they live, things of that nature. Uh, wants to know if I'll ever get back to the Tampa Bay area, which is where I'm from, uh, and I do at times. My mom still lives down there, so I do uh, get back there when I can. And I wants to know if I ever miss the suburban life versus the big uh, New York City life. And I do miss it in the sense that New York City is very noisy. I don't like a lot of noise. It's also very dense with a lot of people. And over the 20 plus years that I've lived here, um, I've sort of that sort of worn out on me and starting to annoy me. So I have started thinking long and hard about getting out of it back to a quieter lifestyle. We'll have to wait and see though. Mike Stewart uh, asks, what is my favorite horror movie? And I don't have really a specific one, but Nightmare on Elm Street series and Friday the 13th series, especially the ones out of the 80s, those are ones that I've always really enjoyed. Um, I also like a lot of John Carpenter movies, uh, the Halloween uh, movies, as well as Christine and uh, The Fog and stuff like that, The Thing. So a lot of those are really great. I do like uh, old classic 80s era um, uh, horror movies. Uh, and also wants to know if I have the Crow soundtrack in my collection. Yes, I do. Saw the movie when it originally came out in the theaters. Great, great soundtrack. Love all the one-off uh, songs that are on there from like The Cure and uh, Pantera and stuff like that. All right, then Jamie and Anne's Adventure asked the question, do you like video games? Uh, generally speaking, no, I never really got into video games and certainly don't play them today uh, the way that you're probably thinking of when you're asking me about video games. As a kid though, and arcades and stuff of that nature, my favorite game at the time was Dig Dug. And you might not know what that is, Google it, check it out. But I did enjoy that game a lot as a kid. And then in the um, early 90s, I really enjoyed Mortal Kombat. And I even had a Game Boy at the time and played, uh, you know, had my own cartridge of Mortal Kombat and got into that. But uh, growing up as a kid, I was not allowed to have video games. Uh, we could not have an Atari, that sort of thing. So I guess that's why I never really got into it. Also getting into music for me, music being my more of my passion, that took up all of my time and energy as opposed to uh, getting into video games. All right, and the uh, final question of the question and answer session number seven, um, Peter Podrosky asks, does my cat like music? My cat's name is Noodle, by the way, which I know I answered for you guys in the uh, channel update, but um, yeah, I would say generally he does. He doesn't run from the room when I turn it on. I can play uh, thrash metal, I can play classic rock, I can play pretty much anything and he's good with it. Um, he's more interested, I would say, in when I play guitar. I do play guitar, but then I, all of my cats have always enjoyed that. They seem to like live music more than, say, stereo music or something of that nature. So yes, I do think my cat uh, likes music. And there you go. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this question and answer session number seven. Uh, certainly do check back. I have obviously six earlier versions of this going on. Thanks again for helping me reach 8,000 subscribers right now. I really do appreciate all that you guys do and being a part of this community and everything. And certainly looking forward to where we're going to go next on all of this. All right, everyone. Take care. Have a great day. And I'll talk to you all real soon. Bye-bye.